Welcome back to Maniacal Music Musings. I'm your host, Jeremy, as you know, and I'm going slightly mad since I've become org- Orgasmatron. It's a hard job, you know, giggity. Don't take offense at my innuendos, please. There's no reason to be so cruel. The show must go on, so headlong I ride the wild wind to go tell you about my co-host. God help us all. In his mysterious ways, he has been mistaken for the fly. But he's even better than the real thing. He was born in a zoo station along many dead embryonic cells. In his altered state, he is always under siege by the CIU and the hitman Delilah. Hear his desperate cry as he's, the subtraction he deals with is his own murder. Chancy motherfucking Grife. Hi. <laughs> and of course... <laughs> We got him. Yep, we got him. And of course, we are joined by a guest as always to make our shows more entertaining and not just have two madmen going back and forth with each other. And our guest this week, I am very proud to say, is former combat spy, turn host of the Break It Down Show podcast, Pete Turner. How's it going, Pete? Hey, man, it's going great. I, I appreciate coming on your show and it's just always a pleasure to be on someone else's uh, thing, and that's an honor. So uh, thanks for having me, fellas, and I'm looking forward to it. Of course, of course. And first things first, I'm sure we both like to say thank you for your service. Thanks. Yes. And and I mean, combat spy. That's a freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. When I saw that, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I want, I want this guy on my show. I want this guy on my show. <laughs> but, and the fact that you came back and did a podcast, and not even to yeah. do with anything military per se he does a music podcast like your favorite musers do and even nice. has he even does album fights once in a while where it's kind of similar to what we oh, do oh nice nice yeah yeah it's a pretty crazy thing do you want me to explain it or oh go ahead yeah we take we take uh so typically what we do is we take two similarly tracked albums so we'll say two 10 trackers and we'll line them up like in a boxing match and so track one versus track one, and you score like a boxing match. So it's a 10 point must. You have three judges, so like the three of us would judge the fight ahead of time. <clears throat> and then, you know, so 10 point must is like the winner of the round gets 10 points. And then the other uh, contestant in the round either gets 10 for a tie or nine for just like, hey, you know, you lost the round and you get nine points or eight if there's a knockdown or seven if it's like a double knockdown. That's like yesterday versus whatever track seven on quiet riots initial album like just can't keep up with yesterday it's too big of a song and so you just go through the whole list and then um i'll have some other judges uh as our copy box judges to kind of like make sure we're sane and so you kind of compare like you know how out of whack is somebody so someone's like i just really love whatever song it is and uh you kind of get a sense for it and we just each have commentary so we go through each round you know down through the list and then at the end you look at the scores and you determine which album was better and and it's amazing because you uh you start to see what album structure how it matters like the cure has enormously long intros and when you go through you're just like oh my god i'm just worn out by these intros and it starts to impact how you receive the song and now like, it's just too much it's just too much and we're not by these long intros so there's all kinds of crazy things that happen or you have thematic um the round like round six will be like these two religious themes and these two albums were never ever built with the idea that hey one day we're gonna be we're gonna go head to head with uh you know we were talking about journey and jimmy hendrix you know we've had them in the ring um one of the really interesting ones was actually a 91 uh, 91 fight it was never mind versus Octune baby and and uh and I'll shut up about this after this, but um one of the things we realized about Octane Baby versus Nevermind, Octane Baby won easily. And and the reason was was you have a professional band at, at the height of its powers versus uh, a band that made this huge cultural change, but really didn't didn't have enough songs. A lot of the songs are from a high school kid's poetry book and and, and the production value wasn't there and they just they just got out proed by by an incredible band, and it showed. You like, you, you would listen, and you're like, oh my gosh, the production value is bad, you know. And so, anyhow, that's what an album fight is, and it's a lot of fun. But I, I dig what you guys are doing. I'll, I'm going to shut up and let you guys run your own show. No, it, I mean, yeah. I'm stoked. Yeah, I'm honestly stoked to have heard about the show because it's it it sounds like an an awesome premise, and it also, yeah. you know. 
I mean, sounds like a lot of work. It, it, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. We slide music clips in there. Oh my god, it's a lot of work. I, oh I yeah, do, but I mean, that was what I was thinking of as the back end. Like, oh man, the point, Not the point gentle. system alone, the point system for all that. And I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, who's sitting there doing all this math? <laughs> like, oh yeah, the math like, is pretty I, simple. It's it's corralling all the cats and it's the timing and everything. And like when we're really on our game, like when Simmons says, you know that part of Tom Sawyer when they come in. And Getty Lee drops that thing with his keyboard, and we as they're going, and they imitate it. We try to slide in the actual oh, nice. the yeah. keyboard. Yeah. We can't always do it, but we try to do that, or we'll quiet the show down and let the music talk. And yeah. um, man, and we don't always get to do all that production, but we try to, right? And it's amazing. It's amazing. And then, and and uh, you know, sometimes the, the judges. In a, in a good-natured way, we'll get a little chippy, and someone will say something, and and uh, there's just some really great moments in there. Nice. All I can say is yeah. my editing skills feel like a noob level right about now, but <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's I, a lot of work. No one's paying me to do this though, so eh, you get what you get. Until then, <laughs> you want to buy me a couple cup of couple, couple cups of coffee a month, and yeah, I know we could start working something out here. Right, spend more time editing the episodes. We can do that. We can do that, but. As always on this show, we each bring an album to the table to see basically who has to talk shit about what. Usually it's mere chance to talk more shit about each other's album more than anything, but we'll see how it goes this week as always. I I cannot help it that I need a support group for all of the fucking trash you bring. I cannot help this. Oh, it's equal, buddy. It's equal. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) But as always... We start off with our guest albums first because we're nice, courteous people. And <laughs> our guest, Pete, what did you want to bring this week? And why did you why did you want to bring us to the show? What was the reasoning behind it? I, I brought Octoon Baby, uh, partly because I'm gonna go see you two in the sphere next week. So next Wednesday, a week from basically tomorrow, I'll be I'll be at the sphere watching the show. And I thought that that you know I'm I'm diving back into that album anyhow, just to get my 91 back on and seemed appropriate. So I brought, I brought Octane Baby to the, uh, we'll to check the it out, y'all. maniacal musings. We got what you need. We're all living in apartments, condos, vans. Well, dude, even you can have a studio, a studio in a box. Yes, we can help you with that right here at Blind Knowledge. We work on your budget and we figure out your measurements. We'll get you the best sound for the best price. Let me know. 877-237-1143 or at blindknowledge.com. Yeah. I will say, one, you are the first person to ever bring you two to the show. And, I mean, I I know you two. I know their hits that they, they hear in supermarkets and whatnot. So, I knew what to expect right away when I saw that CD. I was like, okay, I know what this is going to be. So, I gave it a listen today. And, honestly, I liked it more than I thought I would. Like, that's the best way I could put it is I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I, I'm not going to say I loved it. I mean, there are some songs I got put on my like list on Spotify. But um, the whole studio as a whole was okay. I mean, the couple of songs I knew on it were, like, of course, the really good ones, as always. That's just the way it's with every CD from a band that people know. So, I mean, it's Bono. Uh, the whole political thing with Bono, I'm not going to get into because Bono is a douchebag in real life. <laughs> and he's just not a pleasant person from everything I've seen. But overall, the CD was good. So I, I give it, I'd give it a B minus. If I was grading it, so no, I've given Chanty's albums a lot worse, a lot worse. So if I've given Chanty's albums fucking G's, and that's I had to make that great <laughs> up just for his album. So, but Chanty, what did you think of you two? Um, uh, so like, I'm not gonna lie, I, I only like two or three of their songs from their older catalog. Outside of that, like, I. I don't I don't like you two. Um there's so many things. Like you were talking about going to the sphere. 
So, like, did they jack up the price of the seats? Are they still just a hundred bucks a seat, or oh, are they like more? Now, for sure. Fucking oh that oh yeah yeah. So like I I literally just read an article about this today, which like kind of reinvigorated my just vitriolic hatred for fucking Bono and the Edge, like fucking uh, the edge is a super talented player that's kind of part of why i hate it so much because he's so fucking awesome but he's like i'm the edge of what my fucking sanity oh my god but like (laughs) so i didn't like they did the numbers right and if they would have kept it like it's supposed to be to where every seat's 100 bucks a seat they would have still made like a mil five because they kept like 90 percent of the ticket sales or whatever but I was like, oh, they're going to totally jack up some of those those seat charts or those seat prices. And based on that, dude, they're walking away with so much money on this. And it's not even a re- it's not even a Vegas residency on it. Like on, on if they were going to do anything Vegas, they should have done like uh, like a solid at least greatest hits thing. Something not just this specific album. Which I'm sure they probably will incorporate stuff in encores, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, sorry, I just kind of realized I've been kind of yelling this whole time. I'm sorry, dude. I just, I just, uh, I don't take it personally. It's not you that I don't I'm like. It's fucking, all, it, good, it's fucking good. Bono. It is fucking Bono. Yeah. But like you know, he's like he's like still feeling. He's guys like I'm still philanthropic. But, like, he has all this fucking money. And then, like, you know, Sinead O'Connor, like, fucking died in, this, like, a very small house and gave, like, all so much money away. But still, doesn't matter. Sorry, I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why you, why you got to be so cruel? I'm sorry, dude. I no, You know what? At least I'm honest, all right? At least I wasn't faking it. I expect I expect no less to come from my album, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> um, I do. I I will say the nice thing I will say about the album is I do get your point about the production quality. Like it, it is a solid. It is a solidly produced album. Um, and like I was saying, even though I hate the fact that he goes by the name The Edge, The Edge is a fucking talented guitar player. That's hands down. That's like. He's yeah. he's not he may not be on my Mount Rushmore, but he's definitely on the top fifty list for sure. But having said that, yeah, I've just I've never been able to get into U two after. I think what it is for me is like they made that money and they weren't really hungry anymore, and it just all turned into this amalgamation of pop and U two, and then. They just started making money and just kept making money. And that was pretty much it. Like every music act in the world? Yeah, you could say that. But I mean, like, not true. No, no. Didn't the Rolling Stones Stones just do a fucking concert? Didn't Mick Jagger get off his fucking rocking chair and dust his gray ass off? Yeah, no, I I, I get what you're saying. But my point is, is, like, Sabbath and Dio made a whole lot of money doing Heaven and Hell. But... They still, you know, were kicking all of the ass doing it. And they just didn't, they didn't lose that edge. Yeah. A lot of bands go past where they should stop. That's the damn truth. But it's true. You, you're not wrong there. There are a lot of bands that should, that should stop that just keep going. But I mean, let me, I wouldn't, let me ask I would, you this though. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube's got, YouTube's got an edge. And I'm not trying to be clever with that. They, uh, <laughs> They do really though. I mean, you're not wrong. If you're if you're going to open up the world's most innovative performance venue for musicians, you're not putting any other band in there except for you two. They're the one that's big enough, <clears throat> creative enough across all multimedia. They're the ones you're going to put in there. They know how to fill that thing with images and sounds. They're pushing the platform. You know when they did that um, Innocence and Experience, that whole sideways arena profile with their with their you know uh scrim i don't know if you guys know about this at all but they didn't play at <clears throat> one end of the arena they played the middle of the arena and then they had all yeah. kinds of innovative you know like 
they're pushing the envelope. You, if you want to see, I don't know, I don't want to pick any bands, but if you want to see pyrotechnics and the classic, I, I'll, I'll pick on a band that doesn't exist anymore. I saw Velvet Revolver, and this is a while back in Vegas, right? And it was a pattern, you know, Slash is going to prance like a pony from one side of the stage to the other side of the stage playing the song. Right. So here, here comes Scott Weiland, and he's going to go thrust his pelvis to some lady's, you know, face in the first album where he sings Meat Plow, right? Um, we've all seen that over and over and over again. And I'm not saying it's not awesome, but it was, it's a, it's a pattern. It's a formula. Right. And, and uh, I don't think you two does that. They go out and they try to push the bounds. So they have an edge and they're a big band and they rethink up things. And so do they always nail it? Yeah, no, no band does, but I, I don't think you can say they don't have an edge. They push, they push it. This album is them pushing the edge and completely redefining it. And it makes you examine their album, their, body of work previous to this and you go damn there's a lot of talent there and it makes all of their previous albums to make this leap and land it like they did it's it's an incredible it's an incredible body of work up to this point like going forward you can say what you want to say but when you get to this album this is this is a canyon i mean they completely redefined who they were what they did Well, I mean, that's yeah. not that's not an incorrect statement. No, I, I say I can't disagree with that statement that that it was yeah. a, re, a redefining album for them. Yeah. But I mean, one could call it redefining. Another could call it, you know, getting back into that steady set of limelight, adapting to the times, if you will. Yeah. 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 yeah but anyway, like I said, it's not. Yeah. It's not even, it's not even just a, like I just like I said, never was a fan of you two except for the yeah. couple three songs, and and I don't know. It's just it's just the way that they're. It's like the way they're done. You can you can feel it more. It's more. I guess I'm more into the raw and the gritty. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Ch Chancey likes it raw. We all know this, but <laughs> like. Yeah, well, you know, like like you can almost feel the pain when he's going into Sunday Bloody Sunday. I mean, it's mm -hmm. that for yeah, me I mean, anyway. That, that's a powerful. That's a powerful song about powerful moments, you know. And uh, you're right. It's it is right. And it's a special song. It's anthemic. You're, you're right about that. Hundred percent. Well, Pete, what were your top five songs of your album? I'm kind of dying to hear this. You know, it's it's uh, it's hard to narrow it down. What moves me, and I think, look, everybody's heard one a zillion times, but I am really interested in how, I'm interested in the relationship aspect of this album as I've grown older, right? You know, and, and you start to look at songs like So Cruel, because when you're young and you write this and, and you're, you're breaking up with your wife, the Edge's wife, you know, and it's, these, some of these songs are kind of, you know, timely in that time and you realize as an adult like your role in the breakup of your um of your marriage you know and and when they did this in their um in their most recent album that they released you know the, the 40 songs they did and you kind of look back and, and you can say you know said it you're so cool like we were so cool i was so cool and there's a lot of that in this song when you look at it with older eyes and i think it just makes it an even better song um in a lot of ways so i like that and i love look and these aren't the, just the number one songs you know so i think ultraviolet light my way it's fantastic i love the killers version of it and i just think this this album closes with songs that i just they're so great and they're not even the you know these are songs that are like there's 12 songs in this album. It's a lot of songs and it just i think it closes great so um i'm really happy with the uh, ultraviolet acrobat love is blindness you know and and the Edge talks about the solo in Love is Blindness and how challenging that was for him because he is going through the breakup of his marriage. This is the end of their youth. And there's real power in these songs. You've got you've to be in a place where you can accept it. You probably have to have had gone through this kind of thing or watched your friend go through this thing where the perfection of youth and the possibility of staying together forever is gone and it breaks you, it breaks your girlfriend, it breaks your wife, whatever it is. Yeah, I see that. So I think those four songs and, you know, um, I'm going to pick one other one. I would say uh, 
Well, I, I think the fly is great. I think the fly is mm -hmm. still speaking to all of us. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, it continues to be a great song because uh, the fly continues to be right. You know, that, that joker, that's a joker, you know, and he's like, let me just tell you some truths. And uh, we're seeing him in the news every night, you know, and, and I was too immature when this um, album came out to really fully get that. But boy, oh boy, do I get it now. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, though this album I want to say one more thing. I want to say one more thing about Love is Blindness. Oh, of course. What, sorry, just because I don't want to lose this. I, 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 this is really important to me. Um, in the most recent Great Gatsby, they use Jack White's version of Love is Blindness. And it's right then when they, uh, if you guys know the, the movie, there's an accident and it kills someone. And it's got these all-seeing oh, yeah. eyes. And uh, it's the perfect song at the perfect time, and it's a perfect part of the song when Jack is screaming it out. Man, what a what an intelligent way to to make that moment even better than what F. Scott Fitzgerald. Like this is this is the producer and the director getting together and using like all these great elements. Like Jack White's version is so like Chancy. It's exactly what you want from that. You know, it's, it's so guttural. It's so real. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a huge fan of Jack White. Yeah, and I don't know if you do, you do you recall that. I don't know if you guys saw Great Gatsby, but imagine how he sings this, and and yeah. then, you know, it's, it's this moment. I'm like, oh my god, that is so smart to pick that. So you take Jack White's version of a great U2 song that's singing about you know this, you know, the love and and death, and here it comes, and then F. Scott Fitzgerald's words. Look out. Like, I think it's great. So it always reminds me of how powerful that song can be in a different context. Now I'm going to shout out for real. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. But good. you're right, though. You're right, yeah. though. It did make that scene all the more all the more compelling. Well, as I was saying, um, this album is, I mean, I have, I have the least songs of this album out of any of the three albums, but not by much. So my honorable mention I brought to this one was Zoo Station. I thought it was like an interesting opening song. Didn't really know what to expect with the name and kind of kind of what I got. I kind of got a no expectation song because it really didn't but it didn't land like enough to be definitive enough to me to really like put in my top five. It's just like, okay, this is not bad. I guess I'll put it on the list for now and see what ends up happening. My number five was even better than the real thing because of the guitar. The guitar in that song is amazing. So and then for number four, I put one. It was at the top of the list at one point, but it got pushed down quite a bit because it's overplayed. I've heard it so many freaking times, and I, it's not even that good a song that I want to hear multiple times. So number three was The Fly. That that funky bass line in it freaking had me hooked. I love that bass line in that. So number two was so cool. Like when you said that, I, I totally agree. Like it's just, I was thinking about past things while I was listening to that song, and I'm just like, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see what they're going for here. I see what they're going for. And then number one, of course, of course, had to be Mysterious Ways because that's mm -hmm. the one song I don't mind hearing over, over and over again in the grocery store because it's actually a really catchy, good song. And the guitar in it's amazing, so. But what I'm really curious here, here is Chansey's top five. Uh, my number five was uh mysterious ways uh number four was uh even better than the real thing uh number three was acrobat nice uh, num number two was until the end of the world and uh number one was so cruel yeah so cruel is powerful <clears throat> Very powerful, very powerful. Yeah, even yeah. even if I even if I don't like uh, an artist or something like that, I always make it a point to go through and pick five of them that I, you know, at least can resonate with on some level. Yeah. I just yeah, usually I mean, save these. I usually save these blowups for Jeremy. It just doesn't happen to the <laughs> guests very often. I kind of feel like a I kind of feel like a dick. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, you don't have to. I, I oh, oh, you finally feel like a dick. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, only because only like because it. it's our guest. If it was you, I wouldn't give two shits about it. It'd be fine. 
About time yeah. you fucking got conscious, you goddamn over. You know what, though, Chancy, it's fine because look, you two deserve some of that stuff. You know, they're fantastically successful, which will always net you people that no matter what you do will hate you, right? And so it's fine to fall into that category. I'm not saying you're in that category, but um, and, and they are, they do come off as pretentious. It's like the Eagles. People hate the Eagles forever. There's nothing they can do about it. And then, right. and then they do things, you know, like, yeah, the other day my friend and I were talking about the Eagles and, you know, when they first started Unplugged, Don Henley's like, yeah, uh, none of those fuckers, oh, I'm going to swear a little bit. None of That's those fine. fuckers can, can use any of my songs on any other thing, you know, and it's like, well, you are an asshole. You know, it's so, like, we were right to hate you. <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> people hate the Chili Peppers. I have no idea why, but they can't stand them, you know, it's so we we get to have our things, you know. And and, and look, <clears throat> as a as a YouTube person, I love YouTube. They're my favorite band. But um, when you guys talk about like you know the philanthropic side, Bono did go in and rub enough backs to make the the financially powerful world forgive debt in Africa in a way that nobody else could. It makes them the most important band of all time. They they did enormous things to turn the tide on AIDS in Africa. No one else has done that. And so you have to give them some credit because they have done these things. And I think you guys do, right? But then again, there's Bono, you know, and you're just like, yeah, I just don't like you. And he's like, I get it. You don't like me. But he did go out and talk George Bush and Trent Lott into doing things that are in no way in their best interest. And I admire him for that. Hmm. Well, speaking of AIDS, I think it's going to go to my album. And I know, I know, bad joke, horrible joke, but forgive, that, forgive that's... my, forgive my innuendo, because I brought. If there's a God or any kind of justice under the sky, if there's a point, if there's a reason to live or die, if there's an answer to the questions. When I got Pete's album, I saw, I'm like, all right, it's you two. I know who this is. I know this band. I don't know who the fuck I want to bring against it, really, because it's kind of a mainstream, almost generic rock band in a way, where like mm-hmm. it's like, I have 5,000 different options of what I can bring against this. It's not unique enough where I can be like, I'm immediately identifying this as a victim of it. Let's go. Or I, or something I was wrong, just like, okay, this reminds me of this. Like, nah, it's you too. And I have nothing that really reminds me of them 100%. So I'm like, all right, what year did it come out? 91? All right, let's talk about another rock album. It's about 91. And I was like, ooh, since I saw this, I was like, bingo. I'm going with Queen's Innuendo album because it came out in 91 and I fucking love Queen. I love Freddie Mercury. And this was his, this was the last Queen album while Freddie was alive. So, what you could tell in this album is his last freaking album while he's alive because the songs are very lyrically going that way. But that's I, I, want, I mean I wanted to bring it anyway because my fa- one of my favorite Queen songs is on the album, which we'll get to. But and it's just overall a pretty damn good album. I mean it's better than uh, the sheer heart attack that Chancey brought me to one show. But how dare you? How <laughs> dare you? Stone Cold Crazy is a fucking classic. <laughs> it wasn't ranked that high in the rankings, buddy. When we did the tournament. When we did the queen bracket, that was not that high in the rankings. I'll tell you, I don't think it was in the first part. So, or maybe it was, I don't remember, but it wasn't that high ranking. It definitely wasn't top 10. But, and I mean, I actually have never listened to this album all the way through until for this show. Because, I mean, I've heard a bunch of songs off this album from the bracket and before, but I wanted to listen to it all the way through too. So I was like, all right, screw it. This, that's the point of the show is to get me introduced to new music I haven't really listened to. So, Let's go to this album, and I was not disappointed at all. So, I think I and I, I think I finally brought something that Chancey can't fucking bitch about. So, but we'll see, we'll see, because our guest always gets to go first. So, what do you think of the album, Pete? I am, uh, I am not a Queen person at all. Oh. <laughs> so, when you picked Queen, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to play along. I'm going to have a positive attitude about it. And look, I don't hate Queen, right? I'm going to be clear about this. I don't think um, and I know. <laughs> and, and you don't hate Queen. Like, you just you just hate Freddie Mercury. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. And, and I've I've thought long and hard about this because I wanted to make sure I had 
I because I don't want to just you know smash Queen because that's that's not what I think about them. Um, but I thought long and hard about it. And so one of the things that I've learned from the album fights about Queen is that they are titanic, right? When they hit the ball, I'm using a baseball analogy here, but they hit at 500 feet. There's no denying that. And and if they get a good like mid tempo rocker, they're probably going to crush it. And so they they do really well. I mean, Fat Bottom Girls, that's a great song, you know. Like it's just there's no denying that. And I love that version of Queen. Um, I don't love when they get too experimental. Uh, when they are like, hey, this toy sounds great. And so they to me are overindulgent. And and there's two other things that they're Titanic because Freddie Mercury is Titanic. He is so massive that when it's time to be tender and soft, he's not good at that because he's just too big. He can't do it. He's explosive. And uh and just like that, Brian May is the same way. Like every time. It's uh, I'm, I'm being nice here, right? When Brian May shows up, I'm always like, hi, Brian. I hear you playing the guitar. <laughs> there you are. Jeez, wow, Brian, you're... And, <laughs> but when, when he needs to be big, I'm like, that's Brian May, and I love it, right? But it's just, they're both so present in the songs when it's not the right time, and and they're and the whole band is so indulgent that it's, it's like they hit a 500-foot home run, and then they drink a root beer float while they go or do their home run trot. I'm like, it's just so much sometimes, you know, and, and that doesn't work for me. And and I think you guys would admit, like, sometimes you hear these things you're like laser beams in this song right now. Okay. Uh. <laughs> hey, 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 you better not be hating on Killer Queen. <laughs> I mean, look, they make a lot of interesting choices and they've never met an effect. They weren't willing to try and use the shit out of it. So, uh, and it happens in this album. But um, the uh, look, it's Queen. They're amazing. You know, they're one of the greatest bands ever. They just they have a very low batting average. But my God, do they crush the ball? You look and you're like, damn. And then they'll absolutely strike out on the next song. So they, you know, for me, they're very hit and miss. But on this on this album, there's some great songs. I have a feeling you're a type of person who doesn't like the Beatles until they came back from India. Say it again. I have a feeling you're the type of person who doesn't like the Beatles once they get back from India. No, 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 that's not true at all. No, 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 uh, no. It's uh, <laughs> Queen is a very specific thing. Uh, here's here's a problem with Queen and a lot of bands from their era. They can't leave the damn fader alone. Re, 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 like okay, like leave that goddamn thing alone. Not every button needs to be pushed. This album suffers from the fact that that Casio keyboard has a lot of presets on it, and they should leave that shit alone. You know, but they um, they cannot stop pushing fucking buttons and that overindulgence. And they're so big, you can't tell them no. Stevie Wonder suffers from this sometimes, too. It's like, Stevie, ease up, lay back, let the song come to you. I'm talking, I'm talking about Stevie Wonder here, but there's there's a point in his career where it's just like no one can tell Stevie no anymore. And and it's it's too much. So there's a lot of too much in this album for me. I just actually had a person do the Stevie Wonder bracket as a one-on-one, -on -one and oof, it's it's a tough one. That's one of the brackets that people like lose sleep over when they're doing it. But it's just like, how the fuck do you pick between Stevie Wonder songs or between Prince songs? Yeah, and there's like, there's so many great. I, I'm not knocking Stevie Wonder. I'm just saying that you reach a point where you're so big and you're so talented that you no one can tell you that you're wrong on something. You're just like. Can you just try it without the tambourine? And does it have to have a fuse box on, or a fuzz box on it? You know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I get it. It's the whole like put down the cowbell thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. so so much of a tough words to call that, but uh, all right, Chanty, unleash the Kraken. So, like, I, I I'm I am a Queen fan, but like, honestly. I never expected that I would actually bitch about a Queen album. Fucking, you <laughs> literally, like, this album depressed the ever-loving shit out of me because you're literally listening to this motherfucker die the entire time you're fucking listening to it. For fuck's sake. I could hear fucking Sarah McLaughlin singing in the arms of the angels fucking all the time. Every fucking, in between every track on this fucking album, I hear her and I see the fucking PETA commercials. For fuck's sake, Jeremy. What the fuck are you doing here? There's other albums from 1991. A million of them. I even found one. Come on. Oh, there are actually Having a said, there's a couple others I wanted to bring. There was, but 
I, having said that, I, I fucking like Queen, so I was able to find five that I could write down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I never listened. I never listened to this album before, so I didn't even know what to expect. I just knew the few songs I knew, and I'm like, that's enough for me to go off of on this one. And we, what was that CD you brought, Chancy, that you instantly regretted bringing? Oh yeah, the newest Offspring CD. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was terrible. Yeah, same thing there, buddy. You didn't listen to it ahead of time, and you're just like, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" When you, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, you guys, sometimes... could you guys make it through this album in one sitting, or did you have to break it up? Oh, one sitting. Uh, it's, sweet. it's pretty murky. I could, yeah, I could, I could, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I couldn't. I had to break it up. <laughs> I couldn't do it. No, I mean, I, I had to sit through. We, we did a, the Queen record. We did the part we did had 34, 36 songs on, so I sat through that repeatedly for days because I, I couldn't make. It. Make it through Delilah in one sitting. <laughs> really? All right. I swear to God, I couldn't do it. Well, no. With that being said, I'll jump to my top five. And, <laughs> uh, and I, I had, I had two honorable mentions for this album. Not the most honorable mentions I had for a CD in, in this episode, but in ten chancy. But number seven for me was "Ride the Wild Wind" because it was kind of like the Queen song that. I couldn't listen to more than once, but it was like a good, I liked the theme of it though. So, and number six was I'm going slightly mad because that's the type of queen song I love. Those ones are, are like whimsical and kind of, kind of funny in a way. Like I like the queen songs like that. Number five was Delilah. You have because no who sense. Because who doesn't like a good Dude, talent? thank you. Thank you. Finally, finally, someone on the show She's, this is what I live with. This is my life. Yeah. Who doesn't like a good ballad? Who doesn't like a good ballad? I love. I love my cat. I don't need a talk box to sing with it, though. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, man. You think I'm, I'm being a little bit mean right now? So I'll stop. Right. No, no. It's great. It's great. This is this is great. The asshole I work with normally. <laughs> I'm here yeah, to- yeah, oh yeah, he's used to me. Yeah, <laughs> number number four for me was Headlong because that's another version of a Queen song I kind of like. I mean, Headlong's a it's a good it's the theme with Queen songs for me. A lot of times, it's the theme of the song, and Headlong is a good song, kind of gets a direction going in this album with that song. Number three is the Hitman because that freaking guitar in that song was amazing. Number two was Innuendo, because I always have loved that song, and it's just kind of like a catchy thing. And then, of course, the reason I picked this fucking album, number one, because it's one of my favorite songs ever, and because it's one of my, in my favorite movies ever, slash favorite musical ever, The Show Must Go On is always number one for me, because it's just one of the most beautiful songs ever written. And, I mean literally the last song of the album and you could feel like the heartbreak in that song because they know that Freddie's not going to be around for another album at that point. Even if the world didn't know, they knew. And you could hear it, his voice, like him singing along, singing that, like it's, uh it's heartbreaking. It's depressing, but it's freaking incredible. Like it makes you feel things that you don't normally feel like every day. And when they took it from Moulin Rouge and did it, redid it and Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor did it for that. I mean, that was just gorgeous and gorgeous and gorgeous. So, I love that song. I fucking love that song. Love every version of that song. Just an amazing song. But what are your top five for Queen Pete? Yeah, um, I, I because I'm not crazy about all of the songs. I thought I would just kind of give everybody one. I, I think the show must go on is, is fantastic. And and if someone else does it, man, I think they can do a great version of that song. And I agree with you. Uh, other versions of it are great because. There's it's it's less Titanic. You don't have to. This needs to be more tender. And Queen doesn't do tender very well. That's what I've realized. So um, that song for sure, awesome, is great. I did not pick the Lila surprisingly. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I did pick. I'm going uh, slightly mad, uh, mostly because the video is great. And even though Freddie is dying and, and he's got to wear 15 pairs of clothes, he's still the showman. And and that's the Freddie I love. And the guys like you know the show us go on and. I just think it's remarkable, and this and the song is catchy enough just to be legitimately good, right? And so that's great. Headlong is uh, that's a classic Queen song. You know, you can just put that on the uh, the set the forever set list for Queen. 
and no one's ever going to complain. You're not going to skip it. It's just a good song. Uh, I picked um, which which uh, Roger Taylor song did I pick? I did not pick Innuendo because that thing is way too long and has two movements, and I got no time for that. Uh, let's see here. Which oh, that's, I picked, an, that's an Innuendo right there, buddy. <laughs> I, I uh, these are the days of our lives for, for Roger Taylor. I picked that one. <sighs> And uh, what was my last one? Um, I did, I did the, I did the Hitman uh, to give John Deacon a little love. So th- those were my songs. But mostly, I wanted to make sure I spread the love around because I actually do like Queen. I just bite-sized pieces, please. Hmm. And chance a lot. Your top five. I'm scared to ask. Uh, so number five is the uh, show must go on. Number five. Uh, Number four is uh, Headlong. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three is The Hitman. Uh-huh. Uh, number two is Innuendo. And uh, number one is uh, These Are the Days of Our Lives. So you, p- we have three that are the fucking same. You literally pick my favorite song, which is your least favorite song out of your five. And you pick a song yeah. I can't stand for your number one. Motherfucker. That, Motherfucker. I mean, that, makes, that kind of makes sense. I mean. In a a weird, twisted, user way, it does. It does. Jesus. You can't make that shit up, people. You would think we'd plan this ahead of time if we didn't, though. We don't talk about the albums usually before we get on the show, even. Because we don't want to hear each other's rage or fury just yet. Save that for the live audience. But, all right, well, that concludes two albums. We have a third thing. You might call it an album. You might not. Depends on your taste. But we do have a third thing. And that one is going to get brought to us by Chance a lot. Chancey, what is your album? So, basically, I was informed of the two albums that were chosen already. And I was advised that I had to choose an album from 1991. And I was like, oh, okay. So... As it just so happened, I didn't even have to do the the whole I hit shuffle on my list or whatever, because there was a song playing that I had been talking with Thea uh, uh, from, you know, the uh, yeah, Rock and Roll Heaven, those guys. And I checked that album and it was from 91. And I was like, sold the man with gray in his hair. And I picked it and I put it on there is uh, Sepultura's Arise. I must be born a mighty word. The Nazi would have fight. I speak your great here I days of victory and might. I hold a better fate in blood. I urge it to be brave. And I've, I've always been a right? Sepultura. 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 I don't care. It's always it's always going to be Sepultura. I don't care. I don't even care if it's not the right way to say it. It's always going to be Sepultura. Yeah, but yeah, Sepultura. <clears throat> um, honestly, like I've always been a huge fan of theirs. I like their. I like how they changed. I like their different time sequencing. And the way that they play their guitars, the Cavalera brothers, especially like when when uh, when uh, Sepultura broke up, uh, and they formed. Uh, oh Jesus! I totally just lost it. Jesus but uh, podcast, you know that. Yeah, yeah. Jesus ain't got nothing to do with this place. <laughs> but. Uh, it's just the 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 sound that like it you could tell that the sound clearly came from the brothers because they even had like so, so, uh sepulcher still does a, they still tour and they have different members and it just it, it's still great but it just doesn't quite sound the same hmm. right, well pete as a guess what did you think of chancy's album now you know it's his i uh I have outgrown um, metal. (laughs) I am 53 and I listened to this thing and it took me a couple of seatings to to get through it. And I look, I pride myself on being able to appreciate most, most forms of music and maybe I'll get there, but 
my um you know my entry into metal was metallica as i'm a bay area kid and and all of my friends had got into metallica early and i got there myself and i was like all right yeah i like this and i just um i was just too far off the, the horizon for me and i i had left that stuff behind so it was hard for me to to find a groove that i could find it was hard for me to differentiate i heard the time signatures they just it just um it would be great if I was working out. I might be able to, to groove on that, but it's just so busy for me, you know, and you might be able to tell, like, I just like stuff that's stripped back a little bit more. And I, um, I don't have anything for this album, fellas. I just, uh, I, I know that it's good. I, I actually, and there are things that I did find that I was like, you know, there are some good things about this album. And it's actually, I, I think it's distance cut distant cousins with auction baby because there's an industrial man machine vibe in this that is definitely in auction baby and maybe that was a thing that somehow uh all these musicians that were feeling on that on that era of music um maybe there's some kind of kinship there and maybe maybe they were all at a show or a series of shows that you know that inspired them that are that are related in some way but those are my thoughts it's uh it's you know, I, I know Sepultura, that's how I say it too. Um, yeah. I know this is a great band and I know that there's a lot of folks that love it, but I'm just not 15, you know? And and um, even like like when I, I, I love to dig into the lyrics, these aren't my lyrics. These aren't things that, <sighs> these aren't things that resonate with me, you know? And and uh, as it, was, it was hard, it was, it was a good exercise. You know, it's like going out and trying something new and you're like, no, this is, this is, not comfortable for me. So I went through it and I, I uh, dig the process of doing that. And I like to make myself uncomfortable and we definitely accomplished that, but it's not my jam. <laughs> <laughs> At least Queen, well, I, like, I like Queen. <laughs> well, <sighs> Chancy Pants, let's see. I've heard the name Sepultura for a long, long time now on all the concert announcements and shit. I've heard this name. Never really listened to them before today. Never knew what they wore. I always assumed they were a lot heavier and a lot newer than they are. But I was expecting another album where I would have to sit there and, and listen and actually watch the lyrics, understand what they're saying. And I was happily mistaken on that, thank God. <laughs> but I will say, I put it on, started listening to a couple tracks of it, and I'm just like at work, head banging along my desk, like typing along while I'm listening to it. And I'm just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I getting a sense of familiarity here? I'm like, did some, did four friends in Brazil like happen to have a uh, Master of Puppets CD and they decided we could do this and we're going to sound just like them. Oh, we're, Bra we're Brazil's Metallica. Let's do it. And bam, Sepulchre was born and they are basically a Metallica sound alike. The, the, the guitar sounds every note of the guitar all i'm hearing is the freaking whole death magnetic album which doesn't even make sense because death magnetic came out like 20 years later at least but it's still like i'm hearing all i'm hearing is metallica guitar that's all i'm hearing the whole time like i'm hearing freaking just uh destroy them all in, in one of the songs i'm hearing destroy them all like guitar riffs and i'm just like what the I'm like i mean it, it was enjoyable as fucking shit but i mean because I kind of knew what I got into as soon as I heard a couple of tracks. I'm like, okay, I, I know what this is. I've heard this type of music before and I enjoy it. I do enjoy it immensely. And I told you, this literally is the album I had the most songs listed for because it's a great album, but just, it's, it seems like a Metallica wannabe. That's all it is. It sounds like a Metallica wannabe, same way Tools and Nirvana wannabe. Dang. Yeah. Tools see, and Metallica I, wannabe? No, he said a Nirvana wannabe. Oh. That know. makes even less sense, but... I don't understand that one at all, but that's why. Yeah, this I is the world I definitely heard Metallica in. similarities, but I didn't think they were a knockoff. Why do you think that they're a knockoff? Yeah. But, well, I mean, when I say knockoff... Like, their, ti their, time their time signatures aren't even anywhere near the same. Like, they literally brought the time signatures with them from Brazil, like... That's South American music, like every for day, sure. twice on Sunday. Sure. Well, yeah. where where is Metallica? Where was Metallica? And still, Metallica is freaking huge. South America. 
Metallica was fucking huge everywhere. They're, they're, they're literally the only band to have toured every continent. Yeah. And they're from the South Bay, which is in California. So, you know, that infusion, you know, South. I don't know. I mean, I heard a lot of riffs that sound like very similar to Metallica riffs and Metallica rhythms. Like, I just, that's why I heard. I don't know why. With every song, I can you, hear that to some degree. You think, you think everything from the 90s sounds like Bush. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't, with here. don't even get me started on fucking Bush. Though. Don't even get me started on fucking Bush. But Do the lyrics matter in these songs at all? Yes. I mean, no. Yeah, some heavy, of them. I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're a heavy metal fan and you like the lyrics of heavy metal, then yeah. I mean, like to me, the lyrics that's, are vaguely are very important heavy metal because it's emotion, it's raw emotion. That's that's actually one of the main reasons why I like heavy metal is because the the way they do the vocals can often be a separate instrument in and of itself. Yeah, like you know, sometimes there's a band called Job for a Cowboy. And they'll break up words down to the syllable, but when you put the lyric all the way all the way together, it's this very impactful and meaningful statement yeah. that yeah. that just you know has to be further explored just because of the way that it flows with this the sound of the music kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And uh, on case in point, like uh, on this album, they actually did the cover of Motorhead's Oga- Orgasmatron. Right. Right. And uh that's funny yeah and honestly i it's one of them situations where i think that the cover is better than the original it, i yeah. i fucking i just fucking love the shit out of that song and I, it just because yeah. it's so simple it's just an e just a basic e chord and i was literally listening to it while i was going to the show playing zombies and i just put orgasmatron on a loop and I got to round like 25, 26 before I finally went down. Like mm. I only, I, I, I died. I didn't even, I died once and didn't even make it to get to my perks to get to stay alive because I was just kicking so much ass, just fucking working it with just, I just orgasmatron just blasting it in the fucking headset. Just fucking, it was, I don't know. Uh, mm. I, I honestly, I don't think I'll ever grow out of heavy metal. Mostly yeah. just mostly just because of the connectivity that it has with classical music and blues and and just all the other things that really just fucking grabbed a hold of me when I was younger. I can appreciate. Uh, that. Yeah. That I I don't remember where it was exactly, but I there was a, a like a conversation that was had where if people could be brought for like you know all the old composers if they could be brought what genre of music would they like the most and more often than not metal was chosen specifically because of the requirement of precision with speed mm. yeah yeah there's something to be said for that it you know this album to me it just felt busy you know and i guess i prefer pantera over mm. sepultura you know, but I mean, but, hey, I, can, I, 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 like, I like, I like some Pantera as well, but I mean, I don't think did see it. Did Cowboys from Hell come out in ninety one? No, eighty something, yeah. I think. No, it was in the nineties. It wasn't in eighty nine. That's for sure. I was like gonna say somebody look it up because I know it wasn't yeah. in eighty nine. Uh, but like, would when you think about like Pantera, not ninety, Dimebag maybe. is doing most of the heavy work on being heavy, right? Yeah, and uh, and so he takes up enough space that there's room to do other things, and it's just there's a it's for me, from my point of view is it's a it's too much of a cacophony, and and if I was producing those guys, I'd strip it back and layer it in and figure out when you could stop. Right, and then add things by design, and uh, I know that's not what they do, and I'm not their producer, so they're going to tell me to shut up. But no, I, I get different. what you're saying. I get what you're yeah. saying. Just, I, I, I still think it would. It, I think personally, it would just take away from the. Uh, but I think that it, I think that if you take any one of those elements away, you would lose that that natural feeling that it had. Sure, especially with it being one of their one of their older works. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, Chancy, what were your top five for your own album? I actually, I've got, it's technically more than nine, but a lot of them I kind of blended together. 
Uh, so did, number nine. Did you pull a Jeremy? Did you pull a Jeremy? Just, I literally, I think I picked all but one, pretty <laughs> much. You can have uh, my share. <laughs> nice. Number nine for me was Dead Embryonic Cells. Uh, number eight was Under Siege. Uh, seven was Altered State. Uh, six was both the intro and Arise. Because I actually slid it up to where the intro played before Arise, and it's actually kind of cool how it's almost like the intro was a demo for what became the song, and it still kind of flows together in its own little way. Uh, number five for me was both versions of the song Desperate Cry. I love both of the way, like the way they changed it for the secondary version and everything. Uh, number four was Infected Voice. Uh, number three was Murder. Uh, number two was Meaningless Movements. And absolutely 100% every single time, number one off of this album will always be Orgasmatron. Because it's it's literally just... It I I can't it's, it literally it, it to me it definitely goes on the Mount Rushmore of, of like covers that are better than the original because it's it's just such a rarity for it to happen on such a grand level. Mm. And that was also changed his nickname in college, so you know he's got some love for it. But which is also saying something because I mean it's Motorhead. I mean I love Lemmy and I love Motorhead, but like. Mm. That shit was well, epic. Pete, what were your yeah. top five if you got five? Uh, so I stuck within the uh, the traditional tracks because um, I didn't know uh, how to behave on that. So I just stuck within the nine. And then I picked the shortest tracks because, as I said, this wasn't my kind of jam. <laughs> <laughs> so I did Infected Voice, and then I did Arise, which I actually thought Arise was good. And look, I don't think this music sucked. Let me make sure I say that out loud to you. And uh, Desperate Cry at, came in at 326, and I was down with that because that was fast. Coming in at 440 was uh, Meaningless Moments, and uh, timing in at 446 was Subtraction, and uh, that was good. You know, and, and I did um, I did look at the lyrics quite a bit, too, on these songs, and um, I wanted these guys to get laid and go on a couple of dates <laughs> and maybe lighten up a little bit, <laughs> but they don't do that, so, uh, you know. I couldn't lean on the lyrics either, man. I tried. I tried. It's all right. Yeah. Oh, fancy pants. I feel bad for you, but no, I don't. But for my, see, I had three honorable mentions for this because, like I said, I actually enjoyed their CD. Too. I was headbanging like a motherfucker to it. Number eight was murder because why not murder? Number seven was dead embryonic cells because that song and the lyrics were freaking amazing. Number six was Desperate Cry, which started off a lot higher, but got pushed down a lot. Number five was Altered State, because the guitar in that song, I mean, the rest of these is mainly for the guitar, mainly. Number four was CIU, Criminals in Uniform, because that one's for the lyrics, too, because that was very yeah. catchy. And number three was Under Siege, because the freaking guitar mm. in that song is amazing. Number two is Subtraction, because right in the middle, that guitar solo followed by, like, the drum and guitar jam out, like, it's fucking amazingly bomb. Like, I actually rewinded that part a couple times just to hear it again. And then, of course, number one is Orgasm Tron, which I didn't even know was a fucking cover until you said it. Yeah, like, dude. You know, Motor I, I, Motorhead. I, I'm not that big a Motorhead fan, but I like that. I like their hits. But as, as, as I know, Chansey hates covers, so I figured that was why it was funny that that was my number one. I normally, I, yeah, I normally hate covers because they're just so awful. But like this one was fucking right out of the park. So there you go, fans. We brought you the wow. amusers. Brought you your albums three, three ninety one. We've done ninety three episode. We did ninety one episode, and that's about it so far for years. But we'll probably hit them all in the next couple of years. <laughs> I mean, it's all going. It's going to happen eventually. <laughs> At some I'll point. I'm still waiting for people to bring us more 60s albums, honestly, but that doesn't really happen often. We've had every other decade so far, but 60s and earlier just doesn't happen. I mean, well, wherever the fuck you're... Uh, I was going to say, Sun, 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 House was, uh, Sun House was recorded in 19... I believe it was in the 60s. I don't count that one because I don't want to remember that one. So... <laughs> 
But we'll be back next week, as always, with a special guest. Joey B, the head of the Blind Knowledge Network, will be stopping by because he asked to come on, and I ain't going to say no to the head of the network. So, And he's a chilled-out stoner guy, and he's awesome to hang out with. So we'll definitely be chilling with him next week and probably getting a little stonerish like usual. <laughs> but Pete, tell them about your podcast. Tell them where they can find it. Tell them where they can find you. Sorry, sorry. Hey, it's the it's the Break It Down show. Uh, just type in Break It Down show. It, it it should pop up. It's we've been around for a while. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Pete A. Turner. You can find me on Facebook and you know all the social media places. And uh, yeah, just love to hear from any of you. If you were interested in album fights, you can type in album fight. It should come up. Although YouTube loves to smash my stuff back, but uh, there's some really really amazing fights out there. I'd love to have you guys come do an album fight with me too. And uh, I'll, hope, I'm well, down. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of fun, fellas. It it is it is crazy when you're forced because the thing is is I don't like it when you tie, and so I'll call you a coward if you do. You know, like you can have a tie for a fight, <laughs> not for a round. And I might like, cut that baby in half. You have to decide. And so, yeah. Uh, anyhow, so that's the break it down shot. I really, this is, I I appreciate you guys doing this, and uh, and I I just dig it. I love people creating things, and this was a really good time for me. Yeah, dude, I'm super stoked. I'm glad you came on. Definitely. Yeah. I definitely happy I came across your profile. That's for damn sure. And thank you. We when I create when we when I came up with the idea for this show, I want something that hasn't been done before. And I think I achieved that to some degree. But I mean top five lists have been done, of course. But I mean the whole aspect of it just kind of put different ideas together and made it work. And here we are almost hundred episodes later, I believe. So and we haven't killed each other yet because we're too far away from each other. So, <laughs> Chancy, where can they find your glorious beard of face? Uh, well, the scavenger hunt on Facebook is still ongoing. No one has been successful as of yet. This is my actual first name. Good luck finding me. Uh, on uh, Instagram and uh, TikTok, it's uh, the Red Eye Roundtable. And on X, it is uh, Red Eye Table. Do you ever stop and think maybe there's not looking? They may not be. That's cool, too. <laughs> I mean, if they're not looking, then that means that I ain't got to worry about it. That's uh, true. Well, you always know you can find both your musers on Facebook as the Uncensored, Unapologetic, and Untamed UQ Podcast Collective Facebook group. And you can find us on X and Instagram as at Juggalo Bastard. You can find us on Tiki Taki as at Juggalo Bastard Podcast. And you can find us on YouTube as Maniacal Music Musing. So fuck YouTube right now. And you can find us streaming live on YouTube as Blind Knowledge Network. Because all knowledge is blind. Until I listen to Spultron, maybe got a little more blind. I don't know. I'm still trying, I'm still trying to see straight. But... You'll catch your users next week, and we'll thank Pete one more time for coming on because it's been a blast having him on and getting to talk some '90s rock and some '90s metal. But until next time, <laughs> your users are out for the night. Spaces, what are we living for? Abandoned places, I guess we know the score. On and on, does anybody know what we are looking for? Another hero, another mindless crime behind the curtain. Take it anymore. The show must go on. The show must go on. Yeah. Inside my heart is breaking. My makeup may be flaking, but.
Yesterday we broke and never died. 